Welcome back to my channel, guys. I'm Tara Hannon from Blooms and Benedictions, where we walk with Christ to find the roses among the thorns. Give me a thumbs up if you're into fairy tales and a thumbs down if you're into epic failure. So today you're gonna get a bit of both as I tell you my testimony on my journey to love and the power of your person. There are four very important people and I'm going to teach you a Christian perspective on how to get all of those relationships in the right order. Number one, your savior. Number two, yourself. Number three, your squad. And number four, your spouse. Stick with me. So just look at these people. They're so in love. It's obnoxious, right? <laughs> Glowing, sunset, dewy faces. Mm. But seriously, I have such a blessed life. I don't have all the trappings of fame or success. I drive a crappy minivan <laughs> and I live in an overpriced rental in the Bay Area of California. But all the things that really matter, I am all set. And I almost ruined it and traded all of this for a lie. I love my Jesus. I adore my boys obsessively. We are best friends. They won't tell you that because they're in junior high. And I'm married to the one human that makes my soul sing. We totally get each other, even though we are complete opposites. We never fight, and I mean seriously. It's like once a decade, and that is such a gift. I help him in ministry, he helps me with my digital ministry, hashtag blooms and benedictions, all of you guys, and we just get to do this robust thing called life together, and it's so fulfilling, and it's so full of the love of Christ. Now, I'm definitely not saying that my life has not been without hardship. Before you're thinking, oh my gosh, this lady is so annoying, just bragging about her life. That's not what I'm getting at. I have had plenty of difficult diagnosis. I have suffered through a season of unbelievable grief after the shocking loss of my dad while we were living in his home. I have had friends betray me. I live with a chronic pain condition that I deal with every day of my life. But I still promise you, amidst all of these hard things, you want a life like mine. Because with the things that really matter, I finally chose right. And I want you to as well. So 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So what's a deal with a yoke? That's kind of like an old-fashioned Bibleese word, right? Well, basically, all it was was this harness that went over two oxen that had a job to do. So if one was stronger than the other, what would end up happening is that that stronger one would drag the weak one around and they would actually end up going in a circle oftentimes because it was so ineffectual. And over time, it would gradually fatigue the stronger ox. So pay attention to that. The weaker one in the relationship actually has more influence on the stronger one. Eventually, they will drag them down and weaken them and bring them to their level. So we need to have healthy, equally yoked relationships, not just in love, but in all the most important relationships in our life, which if you remember our little alliteration, the four S's, what are they? Savior, self, squad, and spouse. And remember, not all of us are called to marriage. Some of us are called to a life of singleness and it's equally beautiful and effective. But for those of us who are called to marriage, you wanna get these in the right order. Okay, number one, the power of your savior. First John 419 says, we love because he first loved us. So getting Jesus at the pinnacle of your life in that first place in your heart, that's the most important thing to have the life that you want to live. He is safe, he is wild, he is kind, he is forgiving, he is perfect, and he's done everything to be with you. So don't waste the time. You have to give your heart to Jesus. He is your savior, the preeminent place in your heart that will make everything else worth living. Heaven is real and he's made a place for you. Don't waste the time. Give your heart to the Lord. That's the number one relationship that you need to get right. Number two, the power of yourself. 
Song of Solomon 4.2 says, you are all together lovely, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Do you believe that? Do you feel flawed? Do you feel ugly? Do you feel shame? Is your mirror telling you lies? If it is, I encourage you, I give you permission, smash it. <laughs> Get it out of your life. Get it out of your world. Because the word of God says that you are perfect and there is no one that he prefers more than you. You are enough. In him is your identity and your confidence and your purpose and your calling. His banner over you is love. Without Jesus, we're a selfish, sad, anxiety-riddled, angry people, aren't we? But in him, we can heal and be made whole. So don't waste the time. Work on your character now. If you want to live that thriving life, you need to work on the power of the person of yourself. So get a mentor, get a counselor, whatever you can do to get connected and be rooted and work on the growth of yourself, do it. Start today. Crack open your Bible and let it begin to transform who you are. Number three, the power of your squad. Who's your squad? It's all your pals. It's your friends. It's your besties. It's the people that you go through life with, the ones that you're calling up on a Friday night and you want to hang out. Did you know that those people are so influential in your life that social psychology actually posits that those close associations determine up to 95% of our success or failure in life? So those are some pretty powerful friendships, right? If we're not choosing wisely, if we're not choosing to spend time with people that uplift us and point us toward Christ, then they're having a really negative effect in our world. In fact, social psychology also suggests that the five closest people in your world are the most influential. So think about who they are right now and consider they are the ones that are influencing your behaviors, your attitude, your outlook, your morality, all of the things that really matter on a day-to-day -day basis. They're the ones who are shaping you. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. So remember the analogy of the two oxen. Whoever is weaker, they're stuck in sin, they're full of profanity, they have loose morals. Eventually those things are going to influence the stronger one. You may think, oh, I'm healthy, I'm spiritually strong. But if that's all you surround yourself with, they're slowly going to chip away at the integrity of your spiritual walk. So a friend loves at all times. They have depth. They have loyalty. They speak life to you. They tell you when you're wrong. <laughs> they tell you the hard stuff that you don't want to hear. They confront you in love. They support you. They don't flake out. They don't like FOMO and show up to some other event <laughs> when you've invited them. They are a best friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is what your squad needs to look like. A good friend is loyal, admirable, truthful, and uplifting. So where do we find these good people? If you currently have people in your life that you know are a super negative, disparaging influence on your spirit, then consider taking some steps back. Consider cutting them off in relationship. And maybe that doesn't mean that you never talk to them again, but you definitely put some boundaries and some distance there because they are tearing you down you know who they are. <laughs> Let that conviction just settle in and do the right thing. Be the friend that you are looking for because the power of the person of your squad is very influential. Number four, the power of your spouse. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. So if you wouldn't marry them, you have no business dating them. It's a non-starter. Don't even bother. Make a Bible-based list and stick to it. Not like a list like mm, six, four, blue eyes, like perfect cut abs. <laughs> that stuff fades. That stuff doesn't matter. I'm talking like a Bible list, like the integrity of the person, what their calling might be. Things that matter to the Lord need to matter to you. So remember the law of spiritual gravity. 
they will pull you down. You will not pull them up. Jesus didn't missionary date and neither should you. <laughs> it's not biblical. It's not effective to say, I'm going to date this non-believer and bring them into the kingdom of God. You are called to find someone that you are equally yoked with. So no missionary dating. No, 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 no. Don't do it. Okay. The good guys, they're hiding under bowl cuts and the good girls are peeking out of turtlenecks. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean that the good guys are not obsessed with their appearance. They might even like, I don't know, look kind of like shabby or like nerdy. When I first met Buzz, he definitely had like a <laughs> like just that traditional bull guy. His bangs were like straight down. I was like, okay. He's wearing knit ties at our college because ties were required. And anyway, I was like, I could work with this. Like this isn't a deal breaker. There's like some nerdy exterior stuff going on, but the man has a heart of gold and that's what matters. <laughs> that's what's going to be loyal and keep you safe and stay in the marriage for generations to come. Not the person that's obsessed with their appearance and working out and every hair in perfect place. Not that that stuff is bad, but sometimes it can be a signal that they aren't in the right place. And what I mean about the girls peeking out of their turtlenecks is that they're modest, that they have integrity, and that they're not trying to attract men through lasciviousness that's totally inappropriate. Something that Buzz said to me when he met me and that he said, I instantly was attracted to how modest you were. So girls, ladies, the men that you are looking for, they are also looking for women of integrity that have modesty and decorum. Marriage is not the answer. It's not the secret to a happy life, but I guarantee you that marriage to someone that you are an equally yoked with is the key to suffering. And I don't want that for you. Okay. Before I tell you my testimony, my final tip is don't date dead people. Now, what I mean by that is don't date someone that's spiritually dead. If you are unequally yoked, don't date that person. They are not in the kingdom. They do not have the same standards and values as you. So let me tell you about the one time that I traded all my good Christian values to date a dead guy. So in high school, I was that good Christian girl. I led the Christian club. I prayed around the flagpole. I was always trying to do the right thing. And there was this popular crowd of people that I never really reached out to. And when I got to my junior college, on that campus, one of those guys from that crowd bumped into me and he was like, Tara Dawson, right? Maiden name. And I was like, yeah, right? Ha <laughs> ha. Never thought that like we would speak to each other. And he was like, yeah, I used to always see you guys praying around the flagpole. And I always wanted to reach out to you because I knew that you could connect me with God. And I really need to be connected with God. And I was like, what? Like, mind exploding. This is amazing. This crowd that I was too intimidated to ever really evangelize to is reaching out to me. Well, long story short, we totally fall in to this missionary dating manipulative relationship where he was getting really confused on what he was actually after. I was trying to show him to the father, but he was just trying to date me. And because I wasn't setting good boundaries, I wasn't passing him off to someone else, to a guy, perhaps a man who could have stepped in and been that right relationship and that mentor for him. We just stayed in this very unhealthy, very manipulative relationship. And I had so much guilt and so much shame and so much regret and sorrow because I'd always been that girl who never dated anyone because I had my list and I had my standards and I knew exactly who I was looking for. And suddenly I was in this relationship that was nothing that I had ever wanted. And it was so unhealthy, but I felt like, well, I chose this. So I have to be loyal and I have to drag this person along and connect them to the Lord so that they can be good enough for me because this isn't good for me and I know that. And so long story short, I'm at college and I call him back, you know, as you do when you're dating. 
And it's been a long time by this time, you guys. And I'm just like casually making conversation. And I say something like, like, hey, how long has it been since you have been clean of drugs? Like I knew that he used to do stuff like that back in high school, but I'm thinking that it's been a long time now. And the phone just goes silent. And he's like, um, maybe like, uh, like two weeks now. Oh my gosh. I'm like two weeks, <laughs> two weeks. I'm thinking, <laughs> kick the camera. I'm thinking he's going to say like, like at least two years because we've been together for two years and suddenly my whole life is a lie. I know it's a lie. I know that I've been doing the wrong thing. My squad has been telling me, my parents, my best friends, they've all been trying to shake me out of this place of apathy and incorrect decision. But suddenly in that conversation, I am just jolted awake where all of the blinders fall off my eyes and I realize I'm not even engaged to this person. I don't have to stay with them. We don't have to get married. And I hang up the phone and I cry the most bitter tears. Why? Because I wasted two years of my life and integrity to be with this person that I was unequally yoked with and should never have been with. And I called him back and I said, I feel like I have been dragging a dead corpse through the desert for two years, trying to get you to live the life that I need you to live for the Lord. And now I'm free. I don't ever have to do that again. You have set me free with your admission. And I released him. I was like, I don't have to be with you. I don't have to date you. I am free. And you guys, I felt like I made this commitment to the Lord that I will be single forever before I ever, ever, ever date someone that is not from God, that is not walking with the Lord and giving their heart to Jesus. And I really, truly thought that I would be single forever and ever and crazy thing. But I met Buzz two months later and I did not feel worthy I did not feel clean enough. I did not feel like my life was shiny and like washed up enough to be with this holy, honorable man of God. But you guys, that's the grace. That's the grace of Jesus. He gives us things that we do not deserve. And he said, here is your person. Here is the gift that I have for you. You guys are equally yoked. You will walk in alignment all the days of your lives and you will have the best life because you will know me, you will serve me, and you will do ministry for me in love and in tandem with each other. And after one conversation with Buzz, I knew this is the man for me. I know that's not everybody's story, but it was surreal. I was like, you're who I've been looking for my whole life. <laughs> you say ridiculous things like, moreover, in casual conversation. And I'm like, who says that? Nobody says that. It just was so amazing to me that he had this high intelligence and this deep love of the Lord. He was so funny. He was so personable. He was just everything I've been looking for. And I had to look past the stupid stuff, like the pointless stuff, the things that didn't matter, the things that I was being prideful about, like the knit tie and the bowl cut. But I knew that his heart was for me. I knew that his heart was in the right place with the Lord and that we'd be together forever. The most surreal part of that story is that in that first conversation that I was having with Buzz, thinking in my head, who names their kid Buzz anyway? <laughs> what kind of name is that? I'm sitting on this bench at my college and I'm talking to this person who will be my future when in walks my past and tries to come back into my world. <laughs> and Buzz says, oh, who is that? And I'm like, that is a long story. But the surreal part is that I could have missed my future if I'd stayed in my past. If I had stayed connected in this unhealthy relationship, I would have missed the greatest gift that God had for my life. That's the power of your person, but you get to choose. I chose right and I've had the best life. The Lord has been so gracious and I want that for you too. 
friend, I encourage you to look for an Ephesians 5.25 spouse. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. That's a sacrificial love. Marriage to a spouse that will love and sacrifice for you is everything. And I want that for you. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Tara Hannon. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video with someone that you know needs to hear the testimony of Don't Date Dead People. I love you guys so much and I'll see you next time. God bless.